Uh, welcome to this uh, uh, panel um, of the uh, ESRB conference um, on uh, um, the microprudential policy beyond banking. And indeed, uh, this is a very important topic to which uh, both the ECB and the SRB has, uh, have dedicated a lot of uh, attention uh, over the years uh, because we know that uh, it also contributes to the problems of excessive leverage and liquidity uh, tensions uh, that are behind the uh, crisis. Uh, and uh, the importance of the non-bank uh, um, segment of the financial sector uh, has increased uh, enormously. Uh, just to remind you of some uh, figures, the um, total of money, money market funds plus investment funds in 2008 in the euro area represented only 17% of total assets of the banks. Uh, and now it's 40% because total assets of the banking sector uh, um, have declined by 18% and the aggregate uh, uh, assets uh, of the funds industry has more than double than 2008. And so this creates its own uh, potential uh, risks uh, of leverage and liquidity, uh, liquidity spirals we see that the segment of investment funds has been increasing the uh, average maturity of its uh, assets, which uh, means an increase in potential uh, liquidity risks. We also see that there is a lot of procyclicality in what uh, regards margins and haircuts um, that affect precisely the possibility of building up leverage um, and creation of uh, uh, inside liquidity, both uh, via derivatives or uh, via um, repo, uh, in the repo market. So it's, I think, totally justified that uh, we uh, have a reflection on uh, what to do in terms of macroprudential policies uh, regarding this sector. We uh, should do and can do uh, stress tests, of course, and by the way, it's one of the recommendations coming from the FSB in the recent recommendations about uh, uh, asset managers. Uh, and uh, we, have, uh, we uh, have participated uh, recently in a pilot that was coordinated by the Bank of England, precisely trying to see uh, what pressures could come at the same time uh, in the sphere of uh, asset managers. Then um, there are also other recommendations in the FSB uh, um, document which have uh, to do with uh, the possibility in extreme situations of intervention of authorities, regulators, in the liquidity uh, management of the, uh, of the sector, and also uh, an improvement in reporting, uh, including reporting to allow uh, us to calculate synthetic leverage of uh, investment funds, because we know that there is a big difference between the leverage that we can see straight uh, in the balance sheet and what is built up uh, with the derivatives in particular. So synthetic leverage sometimes is quite, uh, quite high. And now, uh, if the reporting is indeed uh, complied with, we will have the possibility of knowing what is going on. And then, of course, there is the whole question of the uh, uh, regulation of margins and haircuts, because what has uh, been done uh, is very narrow. The, uh, as a result of the FSB recommendations, what was done was just for centrally cleared um, uh, SFTs and uh, excluding also sovereign debt from that. So the the field of application of the recommendations of the FSB on margins and haircuts is indeed very, very narrow. So there is a whole discussion, uh, and we have been active. Uh, the, the SRB published a report uh, uh, in the spring uh, about precisely macroprudential tools for um, regarding margins and haircuts. So all these are the subjects that we all expect that the uh, excellent members of this panel <coughs> will address and help us to uh, reflect uh, on all this. And indeed, we have representatives of the uh, public and the private sector, uh, which is good. Uh, 
to have a full uh, discussion. So uh, starting from my uh, left, we have Gabriel Bernardino, uh, who is the chair of uh, EOPA. Then we have Lex Odguin uh, from the LCH uh, group. Stephen Mayor, who, who is the chair of ESMA. Uh, Mario Nava from the uh, uh, European Commission in charge of this uh, stability issues, and uh, finally, Jovan Stenis from Schroeders. So uh, I will follow the order that is uh, presented in the program, and uh, I um, then give the floor to Bernardino, please. Well, thank you very much, um, Victor, and um, it's a pleasure to be in here, and of course to uh, be able to um, talk with you a little bit about um, insurance and um, what we're doing on the macroprudential side. This is, of course, a uh, you know, very relevant area, and uh, as we all know, insurers play uh, quite an important role in the, in, the, in the market. I don't know if I've got the... the pointer? Yeah, the, the pointer. pointer. Yes, yes, thank yes. you. Yes. Just to be yeah, easier. Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> sure. Um, insurers play, of course, a very important role in, in, in achieving stability in the... In, in the financial system and overall in the economy from all the angles, be it as asset um, investors, uh, which are, of course, uh, huge asset investors. The European insurance industry has around 11 trillion uh, of, of assets, uh, 11 trillion euros of assets, and so this is, of course, <coughs> very much relevant, but also from the liability side and the, and the interactions that they've got with the economy. As we all know, um, we had in 2016 uh, the implementation of Solvency II, the new risk-based regime, and this was indeed a major step to, to mitigate uh, the, the, the likelihood and the impact of failures in the, in the insurance sector. We have, of course, a uh, um, you know, process ongoing uh, right now of implementation, looking at convergence and consistency of this implementation, but of course this was a fundamental, a fundamental step in this process of looking to insurance, both from a consumer perspective and from a, a financial stability. But of course, as a risk-based regime, Solvency II is not a zero, zero failure regime. So we need, to, of course, to deal and to have tools to deal with situations where there could be failures. And also, of course, Solvency II, it's a, it's a micro supervisory regime. So it's focused on the, on the entities and on, on their probability of failure. At the same time, of course, already Solvency II has some elements which we can see from a more macro perspective. There are some, uh, some elements look, that are looking in terms of uh, avoiding excessive procyclic procyclicality, et cetera. Now, what we are looking at right now is to see also how this links to the possible externalities that the insurance sector can, uh, can produce and can have for the, for the overall uh, financial system and this element of uh, analysis of, of systemic risk. For us, there are two fundamental uh, elements that need to be developed for the 2021 review of Solvency II um, to complete the prudential framework on the insurance sector. One, it's a macroprudential framework, including the way to look at systemic risk from a specific, uh, uh, specific uh, uh, insurance sector. And the second one, uh, a recovery and resolution framework, including the, the role of insurance guarantee schemes. And so these are the two uh, elements that are really now uh, uh, strong on our agenda, and I will, I will tell you a little bit about how uh, at AOPA we are, we are looking at this. Firstly, on, on the macroprudential framework. So the first, the first thing that we, we, uh, we, we, we wanted to do was to define very clearly what were the objectives that we were targeting. You know, as you know, in terms of defining a macroprudential framework, it's, it's fundamental to understand the objectives that you've got. So the first thing was to look at you know, what are the operational objectives that, uh, that we want. And we defined a couple of them and must, must uh, in, you know, emphasize the, a, number of, a number of these operational objectives. Firstly, to ensure that there is sufficient loss absorbing capacity and, and reserving. You know that in insurance, contrary to banking, for example, reserving is a fundamental element because, of course, in insurance, you've got the inverted cycle, so you receive premiums to pay claims afterwards. So to have uh, sound provisioning and sound reserving, it's fundamental. So this is a, definitely an, an operational objective. Then looking at the situations, of course, where we are, uh, with, the, with the search for yield because, of course, of the low yield environment, uh, we believe that definitely discouraging risky behavior is also another important operational objective, limiting procyclicality and discouraging excessive concentrations. So we believe that these operational objectives are fundamental if we want then to define a macroprudential framework for insurance. 
Intermediate objective, of course, will be to mitigate uh, both the, the, the likelihood and the impact of, uh, of the systemic crisis with the ultimate objective, of course, of preserving financial stability and having insurers contributing to this, uh, uh, this uh, stability. Now, the way we're looking at to systemic risk, uh, um, and I put in here this, uh, this uh, graph just to give a little bit of the idea, there's been a lot of uh, work in these uh, last years about systemic risk and insurance. And I must confess that, uh, you know, we, we were feeling the, the absence of a conceptual framework of to, to, think on, to think on this. The first initiatives, I think it were much prone, of course, from, a, you know, an, an idea which was concept, conceptually linked to what was the, the thought process in the systemic risk in the banking side. So we had, we had to differentiate and to see how can we look at uh, uh, systemic risk in insurance. And this is basically the, the, the kind of conceptual basis that we are working right now. On the one side, what is important uh, to start is to understand what are the activities from the insurance side and, and how these activities, of course, drive the risk profile of companies. Then, of course, by having different types of activities, you will have different risk profiles. And then you will have, you need to look at, to look at it from an entity-based perspective, an entity-based source, but from an activity-based source and also from a behavior-based. And that's what we're looking at right now. So the activities, they derive the risk profiles. The risk profiles, of course, will have systemic risk drivers. These systemic risk drivers, of course, will have then transmission channels that can then, of course, uh, have an impact on, on the financial system. And depending on when you look at from an individual perspective, entity-based, or if you look at from an activity-based on a behavior-based, you will have, of course, different systemic risk drivers and different transmission channels. We are definitely following this conceptual approach, but very importantly, we're trying to link it to what we already have from a micro perspective. Because as I said, there are a number of elements already in Solvency II which are quite relevant from a macro potential perspective. So we want to define an approach to systemic risk and to macro potential policy and insurance that is consistent with the micro supervisory regime. And risks and risk drivers that we identify and then the, cons the, the consequent transmission channels that are dealt with already sufficiently in an entity-based approach in a micro regime, uh, they should not have been, they should not be duplicated from, from a macro perspective. And at the same time, we need to ensure that the risk measurement that we do from a macro perspective is consistent with the risk measurement from the, from the, the micro one. Otherwise, you will have you know, different incentives for the companies and for the managers, and they will have, of course, much more difficulties from, from a supervisory perspective. So this is work going on right now on identifying what we have already, what we need, if there are tools that we still need. But this element of looking at it from an activity base, I think it's a huge different approach than from the banking side, where you have, of course, only the focus on the, on the entity base and on the designating entities. Finally, on recovery and resolution. We have issued in uh, July uh, an opinion from our side on this towards the European institutions. Of course, you know, if, if you have a good micro regime and a good macro regime, this should limit, of course, uh, the casualties. But if all of these go wrong, then we need to have a process to have an orderly resolution of, of insurers. And so that's what we advocate in this opinion towards the European institutions. For us, it's fundamental that uh, to have a recovery and resolution regime in Europe because it's quite fragmented right now between the different member states. Are, the tools are completely <coughs> different from different supervisors around Europe. So we need to have a minimum framework to have a, a recovery and resolution of insurers in a, sound, in a sound way. And this is tremendously important from financial stability perspective because, of course, we have a lot of cross-border groups, but it's also tremendously relevant from a consumer perspective because if we want to have more cross-border business in Europe, we need to make sure that at the end, consumers will have you know, a fair treatment uh, uh, throughout Europe when things go wrong. So basically, the key building blocks of this the scope, we believe that it should be applied to all solvency to uh, companies, of course, with due proportionality in there. Preparation and planning, uh, of course, preemptive uh, recovery and resolution planning. Actually, preemptive recovery planning, it's a natural extension of what we already have with solvency two, with the own risk and solvency assessment, where companies need to look on a forward-looking perspective to their needs. So this will be a natural extension of that. Then very importantly, of course, early intervention uh, that 
you know, should work before you breach the capital and you still have equity in there to, to deal with. Um, in insurance, things are, of course, different from the banking side. We were not advocating to have one sole trigger. Uh, we believe that, uh, of course, there are a number of criteria that we need to have in, to, in order to define what is the point um, you know, of, of non-viability. But again, linking it to the solvency regime that we have in place in order to have this working in a consistent, in a consistent manner. Finally, of course, uh, resolution, including the objectives of resolution, the tools that we have in there. Uh, we touched upon, in our opinion, on, of course, on the, you know, on the thorny issues of uh, write-downs, both of, uh, of creditors, but also as a last resort measure uh, for, for liabilities, policyholder liabilities. Uh, Bail-in is something that, uh, you know, in some cases in insurance, it's already embedded in the contracts uh, uh, in there. But, of course, as a last resort measure, if people go, you know, worst in insolvency, that if they will uh, have a resolution which is, uh, uh, which is done in a proper way, we, uh, we, uh, we believe that there should be this power should be also in there. And, of course, lastly, uh, cross-border cooperation, crisis management groups, all of that, that it's, of course, uh, I think already an international standard in this area. Just two final things, follow-up work. We are looking now at uh, resolution funding, so as part of this uh, uh, mechanism of uh, recovery and resolution, and uh, the role of insurance guarantee schemes. And I think that this is fundamental. Again, in an internal market to have cross-border business, you need to have these tools there in order to have a completeness of the framework of insurance. That's what we want to achieve um, towards the 2021 review of Solvency II. Thank you very much, Gabriel, for this uh, overview of the uh, problems from a macroprudential angle uh, of insurance. Now, uh, Lex, you have the floor. <coughs> and uh, pleasure to see you back here. Uh, pleasure to be, to be here. Yes. <laughs> thank you, uh, Vitor, and thank you for the invitation, uh, indeed. What I will do is first uh, make a few general remarks on the further development of uh, macroprudential policy and then focus on CCPs in particular. Uh, macroprudential, uh, in my view, aims to focus on the financial system as a whole. Therefore, by definition, I would say all other financial institutions than banks should be in, uh, should be in scope. The fact that that is not yet uh, the case uh, shows that macroprudential policy, although have, uh, it has made uh, quite some progress already, is still in, early, in its early uh, stages of its life. And that indeed uh, justifies... Uh, to look into other institutions than, uh, than banks and the topic of this uh, panel. But perhaps even more important uh, is the further development of a conceptual theoretical framework that allows us to describe and analyze comprehensively not only all types of financial institutions, but also all the interconnections and the patterns emerging from the, those interconnections. The financial system is a complex network, is a complex system. That means that uh, using a framework, uh, you should use a framework that allows you to cope with complexity and also with related uncertainty rather than measurable, measurable risk. Doing that and going uh, somewhat more in this direction would imply a shift in emphasis from assessing systemic risk to coping with what I would call systemic uncertainty. It would imply a shift in emphasis from financial stability in a more narrow sense as objective to resilience of the financial system uh, as an objective. It would imply a, a shift in emphasis on stressing the importance uh, of, diver <coughs> of the diversity rather than diversification. It would, uh, it would imply that developing the right conditions uh, for resilience uh, is, is more the emphasis of policy, should be more the objective rather than uh, targeting precise outcomes for systemic uh, risk. Interconnectedness, I think that's where it's all about in the end in macro uh, policies, uh, also refers to the policies themselves, uh, I think we should uh, be aware of not only of macroprudential policies with the different prudential policies uh, and conduct of business policies, but also with monetary policies uh, and government debt management uh, policies. Uh, for us, the CCPs, um, 
the past few years, the latter policies, so monetary policy and government policies, have at several moments had strong, strong impacts. And it uh, goes too far to elaborate too much, but let me give uh, three quick, quick examples. Let me mention them. Uh, the introduction of the leverage ratio and the repo and the repo market uh, led to uh, in increased uh, investment uh, risk, reduced our investment capacity. Uh, unconventional, second example, unconventional monetary policies and volatility, uh, the volatility of interest rates, the impact of uh, unconventional monetary policies on the volatility of interest rates impacted on the, uh, the, the repo market and had an impact on the pro-cyclicality risk of, of our own uh, policies. Thirdly, and an, uh, an issue that I would love to, to uh, go into deeper, but there's no time to do that, but if I look at our pro-cyclicality uh, risk and the, the impact on our pro-cyclicality uh, risk, we have a measures for that. I come back to, to that a little bit uh, later on. Without any exception, the few breaks that we have had in our uh, pro-cyclicality policies over the past few years all come from central bank actions of government actions. So that's, I think, something that's uh, worth to reflect, to reflect on. Uh, interconnectedness of policies raises questions about the institutional uh, architecture of supervisory policies in the somewhat longer term, I would say, and also about policy coordination. Uh, again, not something for me to elaborate upon, but I think it is worth uh, mention mentioning. Let me now then return, uh, return to some specific CCP issues. First of all, of course, macroprudential considerations are not new to CCPs. Uh, I would say on the contrary. After the crisis, CCPs have been uh, given a role, uh, a very important role, I think, and an important responsibility as guardians of systemic stability and systemic uh, resilience. I see them and I see us, our, ourselves as, on the one hand, private companies, but with a strong public uh, mission. The waterfalls, and, and certainly our waterfall, has, uh, has been developed within, with this systemic role in mind and upfront, uh, as, it, uh, as it were. So looking then at macroprudential uh, uh, tools in the context of CCP, I think first of all, as a general principle, I think macroprudential uh, tools should, to the maximum extent possible, uh, be embedded in the waterfall of the, of the CCP and, on, and in the rule books of the CCPs, rather than be based on what I would call ad hoc interventions. They should, uh, to say uh, the same, in other words, they should be predefined. Uh, their use should be predictable and be transparent to the extent possible and wise. Um, I must say, if I look at the, the current situation, uh, I would say from a macroprudential policy point of view, CCPs look pretty, pretty good at the moment. Uh, at LCH, we, we have to deal with a quite, quite a large number of prudential frameworks that we have to operate, uh, operate in. And it's not just because I'm, I'm here today, but uh, it's, it's, it's really true that EMIR in particular is, is a very good framework also from a macroprudential point of, uh, of view. I'd like to touch upon four, four issues for, for further development uh, and or discussion in the context of uh, the macroprudential framework for CCPs. F first of all, uh, central, bank uh, central bank accounts. I think as a uh, fixed policy requirement, also from a financial stabi stability perspective, CCPs should uh, be able to deposit their liquidity at uh, central, central banks. The financial stability aspect of that is that uh, in managing financial uh, stability, CCBs uh, try to be ahead of, the, uh, ahead of the curve and ahead of the game. So if, if you see problems building, building up in the financial uh, system, uh, what you will try to do is to become more liquid 
uh, then you would otherwise be, and to do that gradually before uh, the, the stress is already at high levels. And the best place to build up your liquidity is at the, at the central bank. So shift collateral-based margin to, to cash-based margin gradually and, uh, and early on. Uh, so that's the first point, central bank accounts. Uh, secondly, uh, further developing uh, what I would call really macro uh, stress test. Uh, I think uh, encouraging developments have, uh, are ta taking place there, but that should, uh, that should continue. And I think it would be, uh, be good to, to combine that uh, with, uh, and also in the context of transparency, to also think about uh, establishing individual CCP standardized stress tests. That was my second uh, point. Third uh, point, uh, finalizing uh, the recovery and resolution uh, regimes for, for CCP. Uh, again, there the work uh, is, is quite, uh, quite advanced, certainly also in uh, Europe. Uh, to make a long story uh, short, there's course, there is of course always something to complain, uh, but by and large, I'm, I, must, I must say, and I will not do that because I think by and large the EC, ECB proposal, the EC proposal, sorry, is a, <laughs> 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 already foreshadowing uh, yes. <laughs> new responsibilities. Yes, I see, I see. <laughs> uh, uh, by, by and large, the, the EC proposal is a good, uh, is a good framework. Finally, uh, further developing anti, uh, anti, the anti prosecality element in CCP behavior. I like personally uh, very much the way uh, we at LCH have done that over the past uh, few years. We look at prosecality along all the aspects of our CCP uh, framework. Let me give one example, uh, perhaps the most important aspect. All margin models that we, uh, that we used are calibrated from that perspective, fr from uh, protecting against uh, uh, pro uh, excess procyclicality. Uh, in short, uh, it means that uh, no margin increases of more than 25% during the holding period uh, can occur. Uh, if the past 10 years are played forward. So we calibrate the models in such a way that if you use the, the data of the past few years, play them forward, that the, the model may never generate an increase of more than 25% in your margins during the holding period, which may be different from asset class to, uh, to asset class. F uh, effectively uh, and somewhat simplified, uh, because this may sound rather technical, but effectively and somewhat simplified, it means that you reduce margins more slowly than would uh, be the case without such a policy and without such a calibration in cases of false, uh, of falling volatility. And I think building on that type of framework and which is related to what I said earlier, it is embedded in uh, CCP uh, behavior, I think is a fruitful way forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Lex, uh, for your important points. Uh, of course, naturally directed to the question of the resilience of uh, CCPs, which have become in themselves much more uh, systemic than uh, than they were before, with the push by uh, the regulatory reforms to have more centrally uh, cleared uh, uh, transactions. Uh, that's very important. Uh, although the questions related uh, uh, either with derivatives or say repos go beyond just the question of the resilience of the CCPs and have to do uh, indeed with the role that they have had uh, before the crisis in creating leverage and inside liquidity in the system. So what we have uh, um, uh, recommended um, particularly uh, in last year in the specific conference organized by the uh, ESRB on margins and haircuts was indeed that there should be um, uh, uh, the possibility of interventions on margins and haircuts, but 
at the same time for centrally clearly uh, cleared and non-centrally cleared uh, transactions at the level of transactions in order to capture also the non-banks because many transactions goes through banks and if banks by being regulated are exempted, uh, then the whole purpose is uh, self-defeating. So uh, we see the need of a more comprehensive uh, uh, approach to the question of margins and haircuts because we know that if they are totally defined by the private uh, sector uh, in individual transactions, they tend to be usually pro-cyclical. I understand that CCPs being aware of their systemic role um, may be more careful in looking also to this pro-cyclicality thing, but that's not the case of uh, uh, other um, investors and uh, uh, that are responsible for, for the transactions. We know uh, how, uh, indeed, before the crisis, uh, that this prosecutability was so huge that uh, for all types of paper, uh, securities financing transactions had very, very small haircuts. And then all of a sudden, uh, when the crisis came, they were huge and created then the fire sales and all the rest when the chain of uh, li inside liquidity collapsed at the same time. So just uh, an aside uh, that has not, uh, not related with what you said uh, from the perspective of uh, CCPs alone. Now, Stephen, margins and haircuts, it's a little bit with you and many other things nowadays are uh, <laughs> coming to your table. Uh, in all sorts of uh, projects and progresses that the Commission in particular has proposed recently with our uh, uh, full support. So, Stephen. <coughs> Thank you very much, uh, Vitor. And, and indeed, the ECB and also Vitor personally have been uh, very supportive of uh, expanded powers for ESMA. Um, thank you very much uh, for, for that support and uh, Fitor has always expressed also very clear interest in uh, capital markets and also stability sure. issues yeah. uh, in capital markets. When uh, President Draghi yesterday um, opened the, the conference, uh, he did it in the context of the 10-year anniversary, or to what extent should you call it an anniversary, <laughs> of the, uh, the financial crisis or the regulatory reform after the financial crisis. Um, and although we tend, I think, to see the financial crisis as being very bank-oriented, it is true and it's clear and also from the debates these days that uh, also capital markets play a very important role in terms of risks in the, um, in the financial system. So very good indeed that we talk here in this panel about stability risks in the non-banking sector. And to some extent that is very unusual. Uh, we are getting used to it now as a result of the financial crisis. Uh, but before the financial crisis, basically, financial markets regulators, securities regulators had very limited interest in stability issues. And I think one of the uh, very clear results of the regulatory reform has been uh, clearly giving mandates to securities regulators to think about uh, stability. So I think that is a, a clear step forward, and we should have an, and that better balance between, on the one hand, conduct risks, and on the other hand, stability risks, I think, is the right, uh, the right way forward. First of all, because uh, as also explained by Fitor, uh, the non-banking sector is growing. We can see it, the asset management uh, sector has doubled in size in the past 10 years. There was the reference to CC CCPs because of the central clearing. Clearly they are becoming uh, bigger and that uh, development will continue. But I think there's also the policy, uh, the, the policy intention behind this is to make capital markets a more important part of the financial system, personally also because I believe is that it will mo make the whole financial system more stable. A very dominant uh, focus on banks in a financial system, I think you can make the argument, is that it will be is more prone uh, to uh, instability. Um, and the reality is if you look at ESMA in the past uh, 10 years, uh, most of our regulatory reform we have been involved in have been more related to prudential stability issues than uh, conduct of business uh, issues. And to some extent, there's been uh, even the risk of a bit of an unbalance where is there sufficient attention uh, to uh, consumer protection, investor protection uh, type of issues. May one final comment on the mandate issue is that it is good that there is more attention for 
stability issues in securities markets. But if you go around the world, you still see that it's not formalized in terms of what are the mandates of securities regulators. And so a lot of the times, the stability mandate is at the central bank, and there's still the risk then that there's not sufficient uh, attention for capital markets issues. In the EU, at ESMA, we have an explicit mandate uh, for stability, and I think that is also, uh, as we also have an explicit mandate for investor protection and consumer protection, which I think is the right uh, model. Uh, I think for the remainder of my contribution, I would like to comment quickly on three areas. First, more generally, what kind of areas have been affected by stability thinking and stability rulemaking? Then, uh, shortly on how should we think about tools, uh, stability tools in securities markets, financial markets, and finally a few brief remarks on the institutional frameworks. I think the general areas in securities markets that have come under, let's say, rulemaking, policy making, subject to uh, stability concerns with stability tools, they've been mentioned here these days, but just to uh, quickly go over them, the most uh, clear one, the clearest one, is uh, OTC derivatives, where we have moved to much more transparency and also much more resilience of counterparties, making sure that they have the right uh, margins, that there are the right uh, risk techniques, risk policy, risk management, a clear way forward there. Asset management, also clear steps forward, both globally and in the EU, with the AFMD, the whole hedge fund sector, and also the private sector, uh, private uh, equity uh, sector has come under supervision, and especially for uh, those areas, there are also specific stability type of measures like the introduction of a lever leverage limit, which is uh, quite uh, a, a innovation also if you're looking at the worldwide level. Uh, in that sense, also the EU is, I think, in, in, the, uh, in the front group in terms of thinking about stability issues in capital markets. Also, credit rating agencies, an area not frequently mentioned, but for example, reducing the hardwiring of ratings in contracts, in rules and regulations is very stability oriented. And the other area that I should mention, two other areas, of course, securities and financing transactions, where we know that these uh, securities lending and repo transactions increase the interconnectedness in the system. And we're on the way in the EU to bring more transparency there, but also bring requirements regarding the reuse of collateral. Probably the final element that I should mention, and maybe not frequently mentioned as explicitly uh, contributing to stability, but if you're looking at securities markets regulating, there's been a gen general trend of going on exchange, moving away from bilateral transactions and moving on exchange, and that in general will increase the transparency over securities markets, and I think it also contributes to uh, stability. Then maybe to how do we need to think about the tools, and um, in banking there are very you know, relatively clear uh, tools how to respond uh, in towards uh, stability risks. Uh, a few remarks on those tools in securities markets. First of all, uh, to stating the obvious, um, first of all, securities markets is a very diverse system of business models. We talk about it as a homogeneous area, but it's not. This is about uh, financing companies, this is about trading venues, this is about CCPs, and each of the subsectors of the capital markets has its own business model, and you need to think about the specific tools that would be uh, appropriate uh, for those business models. And also to state the obvious, uh, these models are very different from banking models. And so asset under management is not a bank's balance sheet, and a run on a fund is very different from a run on a bank. And I think we need to take this very well into account when we devise uh, our tools. Making these tools should be a joint effort, both from stability experts, but also experts in securities markets. Um, and also, I would argue is that we should try to use as much as possible already the micro tools that we have. And just to mention a number, we already have the uh, leverage ratio uh, now in the uh, asset management industry, and I think we can use that to uh, uh, respond to stability risks in the asset management industry. Stress testing is a very new area for securities markets. We have now gone through our second round of stress testing for CCPs, which is very different from stress testing for, uh, for banks. We have done it in cooperation, uh, very good cooperation with the ESRB. We're now in the second round, um, and we need to continue that and, and improve also the methods we're applying there. We're also in our first round of thinking about stress testing 
in asset management. Uh, and there are all kinds of very fundamental questions. Can this be top down or should this be about uh, standardizing the uh, individual stress tests conducted by the, uh, the funds themselves? Uh, so at this stage, I think uh, with the proposals on the table that are now either we already have the measures as we are in the current uh, pieces of legislation or as proposed, I think we have a very good set of tools, although in some cases you don't want to rule out that you need more. One area we're looking into is, for example, the liquidity management tools in the case of investment funds. We know that there's this whole wide range of uh, redemption holds, there are uh, redemption fees, there are side pockets, but if you look at it across member states in the EU, it appears that it varies from member state to member state what is uh, available. Finally, one uh, measure and tool that I should mention that will start in uh, January 2018 is that we will have the banning powers under uh, MIFID MIFIR and explicitly it refers to stability risks as an important reason to ban certain activities, which I, uh, is uh, also, I think, innovative and a tool that we uh, need to use um, when uh, appropriate and when required. Finally, a few uh, remarks on the institutional framework. The only thing I want to say here is that we have many differences. Who is responsible for what? And so if you're looking now at the leverage ratio under the AFMD for hedge funds, it is in principle a leverage ratio that will be need to be set at a national level or is currently under the AFMD, a power at national level, and the role of ESMA is there to give an opinion. And so to some extent, it's similar to the role of the ESRB uh, that also has these powers, uh, powers on recommendations, but no further powers. Under MIFIR, under MIFIR we will have uh, banning powers where it's not about an opinion, but where it's an actual intervention, and we can instruct that that is the power that needs to apply across the EU. I think it's too early to say at this time what is the best uh, model. We need to clearly uh, look into that. We need to get used to using these tools and then evaluate indeed what is the right level to have these stability tools. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Stephen, for your relevant points. I would only uh, make a remark on the um, leverage ratio uh, limits uh, that, uh, as you uh, highlighted, uh, exist, but uh, as far as I know, they do not yet include the concept of synthetic leverage. So uh, they are simpler. Uh, and in that sense, because uh, indeed it's not easy even for regulators to calculate the synthetic leverage ratio, because all the information about the uh, derivatives uh, that are uh, held by the entities uh, is totally reported. But I hope that with the recommendation coming from the FSB, this indeed will progress to a more uh, complete uh, consideration of these uh, of these issue because uh, the methods uh, that exist uh, allow a lot of netting and we saw in the crisis that it's also worthwhile to look to the gross concept uh, uh, of leverage because the edging that is supposed to be there and work perfectly on paper when the crisis come uh, we see that the edging is not perfect uh, indeed and that netting uh, doesn't work so much in practice okay uh, can I Absolutely, very, no, very quick, I, as I challenged you, you uh, yeah, no, so I will you give you yeah, the time to respond. No, very, I will be very quick because you triggered <laughs> yeah. also, and I think that I should yeah. have mentioned in my yeah. opening remarks is, of course, the whole data collection, which yeah. has expanded massively yeah. uh, as a result of the financial yeah. crisis. And we're precisely now in the process where, A, we are collecting the data on the funds and also coming up with a common measure on leverage. One of the things, and because we have no stability background mm -hmm. in this or tradition in this area, is no common definition of leverage. And so one part is on the one hand making sure that mm -hmm. we have the right quality data, but at the same time also uh, a common, uh, developing a common measure of leverage. In our view, we have now the right, uh, mm -hmm. both uh, powers regarding data and okay. the measurement of uh, leverage. Okay, very good, very encouraging. So now, uh, uh, Mario Nava from the Commission, the legislator uh, in these matters. Please, you have the floor. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you very much for uh, 
inviting not only DVP to ICE in a row, but also me to ICE in a row. Okay. So it's the second year, and that's very <laughs> kind of you. It's not you, and it's very kind, so thank yeah. you. What I want to do with you today uh, is to, to have a look at the way you put together, we put together shadow banking uh, and, uh, and the CMU initiatives and propose some reflections on the way forward. As we are to in a EACRB conference, I will even dare to end by making few suggestions to the ESRB on what the ESRB could look in this, uh, uh, in this area. Now, all the uh, panelists before me and also the chair before me have uh, made very clear that, of course, the, grow, the growth of the shadow banking uh, uh, of the last few years has not, gone, uh, has not gone unnoticed. And not only that, but that obviously it's even set to grow, uh, to grow much more in the, in the future. It's revealing, actually, that uh, with the growth, there has been a progressive change in the, way we, uh, in the way we call it. We used to call it shadow banking because shadow meant uh, some sort of uh, absent or lighter regulation. Uh, that may not be any more uh, accurate. I think uh, Steve has argued uh, somehow in that direction and I will uh, even dwell a bit more if possible in that same direction. So actually, from a, just from a simple stylistic point of view, we have noticed uh, uh, institution moving from shadow banking to market-based financing or non-bank financial intermediation. In my remarks, I will be extremely loose, and I will think I will, I will use uh, both terms uh, more, or less, uh, more or less interchangeably. Um, I'll do that also because, let's say, on the one hand, uh, moving towards CMU, which is a flagship uh, initiative of the, of the European Commission, that is just what we expect. So we should expect greater market-based finance. On the other hand, of course, in so doing, and uh, uh, we have uh, all sorts of, uh, of quotes and, uh, and views uh, from eminent policy makers, in so doing, there may be a number of, uh, of risks that emerge and for which we haven't yet uh, thought about. So if you bear with me, I think I'll propose you to go through four points. Point number one, is uh, understanding what are the drivers behind the growth of the market-based financing. Point number two is uh, looking at the existing provision we have, uh, what Steve just did, and maybe deepen a bit that. Uh, number three is look at what we at the Commission could do going forward. And as I said, number four is humbly give a couple of suggestions to the SRB, and then would be for Francesco and Thomas and all the others to decide whether they, are, whether they are good enough or not. Now, the importance of uh, understanding the drivers behind the growth of, uh, of shadow banking. I mean, uh, you could have some simple explanations. It could be evaluation effect. It could be a growing investor's demand uh, and collateral demand from financial institution for safe, uh, uh, for safe and liquid assets. It could be some enabling and regulatory provisions that the market uh, uh, already finds or has anticipated, like the simple and transparent uh, securitization regulation that, uh, that, that is just now in the market. So you could have a number of simple and relatively innocuous explanation. It could also be uh, for less innocuous explanation. It could be some regulatory arbitrage, even some tax arbitrage. After all, one of the lessons of the crisis was exactly that it was through the different loopholes of the arbitrage that, uh, um, that most of the crisis passed. A simple reply to that, which is uh, squarely in the area of, uh, of macroprudential policy, a simple reply to that is to have a, a comprehensive and consistent regulatory and supervisory approach on what operators do. Let me take an example, mortgages, for example. Mortgage provision, there are countries, Netherlands, the country of my friend Stephen, where about 75% uh, is done by banks, uh, and, and Lex as well, sorry, 75% uh, is done by banks and 25 by non-banks, uh, where there we have a macro pro instruments, uh, which is LTV, for example, which could, uh, uh, which could be of use in order to, in order to avoid, uh, in order to avoid that through the channel, you miss uh, the overall, uh, the overall picture. So, the reason for growing are uh, maybe maybe different. Uh, a clear, um, let's say that a clear correlation between the growth of the growth of the 
market-based financing and the growth of the risk has not been established. So there is, a <coughs> there is probably some work to, to be done there. Now, what the current legislation does. The current legislation, as you know, first there is an institutional dimension, which is uh, what the VP presented yesterday. Uh, the ASAS on one side, the SRB on the other side. <coughs> we have proposed uh, important reforms of, uh, of both of them. So I think on that, uh, <coughs> on that side, we're quite covered. As for the activities, leverage risk, you just witnessed uh, a very interesting debate between uh, Vitor and Steven on to the extent that the leverage risk is covered. I would say what I would have put forward without, uh, uh, without having heard that debate was that the leverage risk is addressed to some extent, which I think is exactly what, uh, what, was, said, uh, what was said here. So clearly in the overall area, both monetary funds, FUSITS, uh, and uh, IFMD, the leverage ratio is addressed. One may want to go forward. Take another risk, the liquidity risk. The liquidity risk, you have it addressed equally in UCITS, in IFMD, <coughs> and the MMF regulation. Take the interconnectedness risk. That's, I think, Lex made the point, uh, which, is, uh, which is addressed uh, into, the EMIR, into the EMIR regulation. And I think, clearly, that is an area, for example, where, um, where the, the SRB could, uh, could maybe do some more work on the relationship of the, of the interconnectedness. Then uh, if that is the case, so if the case is that both institutional and uh, from a legislative point of view, we have the tools and the matter is about perfecting the tools, both on the institutional level with the reform proposed and at the, at the legal level with the various points that, that you have raised and that I have raised, well then I think it's pretty natural that the the way forward for the Commission must be divided in, uh, in two uh, phases. Phase one, in the short term, uh, I think what we should do is obviously monitor deeper, deep, uh, monitor deeply the uh, systemic risk and to see whether we can establish uh, a clearer correlation between size of the growth or risk beyond a certain size or anything of that. When you say monitoring, you say data. That's, I think, was a point that was very clear made by Stephen in response to Vitor. And uh, if you say data, then I'm happy to point out that in our uh, ESA reform, the issue of data is very prominent. And we give uh, lots of power to Steve and colleagues to go and collect data in order to, um, <coughs> in order to be able to know what they are talking about. That's probably is what we need to do in the short term. In the medium term, what we have probably to do more is to look at whether we can uh, uh, work on the tools. So I'm not promising uh, anything, but I think that we should have a view on whether uh, additional, uh, additional tools or new, regulatory, uh, or new regulatory provisions could have an impact to eventually, uh, to eventually deal with uh, one or the other subject uh, or risk that has not been addressed. Clearly, I believe it's very important, but this was said by by everybody, it's very important that this is done not in isolation, but is done uh, in an internationally coordinated approach. But for that, I would dare to say, between the work that is done uh, uh, with the FSB and other, and other international entities, there is no particular risk. So if that is the logic of what the Commission could do, where could the ESRB help uh, in doing that? I think the first point where it could help is that, that slide, for example, what, I, what I've been talking about is very little. It's just if you look at what affects uh, systemic risk, there are a number of things that affect systemic risk. I have been talking probably about the first uh, three or four indent uh, under financial policies. There is much more. The SRB with its unique, uh, uh, with its unique uh, uh, pooling of competencies uh, uh, from all over Europe could, uh, could obviously look also at the other area and, and help. And then there are some, uh, uh, some areas where are, are growing maybe faster than we thought and also could be work some analysis. One is obviously the ETF, the passive, uh, the passive uh, funds, uh, fine when they are small, when they become big and the passive become larger, what does it mean? That is an area that needs to be explored. The large asset managers, for example, is, uh, is another one. 
In concluding, what I would say is that uh, um, the, uh, the growth of the market-based financing uh, was in the cards, as, as happened uh, more or less as we, were, uh, as we were expecting. I would dare to say that the existing uh, uh, institutional and regulatory framework and the various modifications that we were able to do over time uh, has helped uh, to, accompany, to accompany that growth. And what, we, uh, what remains to, uh, to be done is clearly a closer monitoring and eventually, but if and only if, obvious risk arise uh, and eventually think of further tools. Many thanks. Thank you, uh, Mario, very much. And uh, finally, I, I give the floor to you, please. Um, you. Vitor, Constance. thank you very yes. much indeed for inviting yeah. me today. No, sure. Thank you very much indeed. Um, as Stephen said, a huge amount of progress has been made, and we would certainly welcome uh, Mario's new proposals last week on expanding the powers of visas. But this panel is really about where next for macroprudential policy, and I thought it would be useful to contribute four remarks quickly. First, strength through, vi through diversity should really be the motto of our European financial landscape that we're creating. Growing market-based finance should be welcomed as a source of strength rather than weakness, and I share Stephen's enthusiasm for a much more balanced ecosystem. But I think macroprudential tools and approaches need to be much more focused on proportionality and relevance rather than on cross-sectional um, consistency, which was the, in the rubric of this panel. And I'll give you the example of how to approach the, the, the fallacy in approaching bank stress tests to the mutual fund industry. I think second, I think macro poli policy in the ESRB can add enormous value making recommendations where they see gaps or weak links due to silo-based regulation and should champion a much more holistic-based view of the system. And I want to use the example of a gap I see around the funding of European small and mid-caps, which obviously generate 80% of the jobs in Europe, where I think uh, there are weaknesses at this moment. I think thirdly, um, I've personally been surprised as a market practitioner how little cyber risk has come up in the last two days. I've really been amazed. For me, this is the single biggest risk in the non-bank financial system that we need to think about, and I want to just add a few comments on that. And then, and I'm sure Lex will talk about that as well. And fourth is really macro and policy. How can it play a useful role in assessing emerging risks? And I'm going to use Bitcoin as a provocative example, but, but more not that I'm worried about it today. No. So I think a diverse ecosystem is a real source of strength. Um, knowing that I was going to be sitting next to Mario, I looked up the EU's motto is united in diversity. Or diversity in, uh, or in each language. Yeah, yeah. And whilst this normally interpreted in different cultures and customs and nation states, I think it's as relevant financial services as it is elsewhere. And I think we need to really think about what we've learned. And um, apologize, if I go to my first slide, please, if you could click yeah. forward one slide. Um, I want to just think about what we've learned through the banking crisis. The banking crisis taught us we needed a much more diversified funding system for corporate, thank you, and infrastructure, because top heavy banks which were too levered, running too much maturity mismatch, were at the heart of the crisis. In the last eight years, pretty much all of the growth of net lending in the Eurozone has been financed through the bond markets. About half a trillion has been shrunk from bank lending, which is the yellow on my left-hand chart. Uh, about half a trillion has been financed for corporates from the markets. In other words, the proportion of funding coming from markets has grown from about 17% to 29% on ECB statistics. Yeah. I apologize, yeah. I chose ECB statistics rather than EU as a whole, but it just shows you how powerful mm -hmm. a mechanism this has been. And obviously, the central bank's quantitative easing and other programs have reinforced this. It's been a safety valve, and therefore, I think we should be, take pride in what we've achieved, but really then think about what do we need to do next. I recognize mutual fund holdings of corporate bonds have doubled in both Europe and the States, and therefore, it is appropriate for us to challenge and ask the question how big a risk they are. But I think sometimes we jump to conclusions. Um, in the last 150 years, there have been numerous banking crises. If you look at the IMF stats, there's over 200. In the last 150 years, that's simply not true, that we do not have good examples of uh, runs on bond funds. The US Money Market Fund, which was short-dated paper, is exceptional. For long-dated bonds, there is simply not a good example in history. And in fact, corporate bond funds have never been flighty. Even in 1994, where we got a big reversal of markets, only 5% of bond funds got redeemed in the worst three months, and that compares to between 5 to 10% of liquid buffers 
that most bond funds are running today, and I can run you through each and every major crisis in emerging markets in the West as a system that, that bond funds have not had runs. Individual funds may have had, but it's not systemic. Mm -hmm. One reason is that many people invest, even if they're investing in daily funds and USITS funds, which are a gold standard, they're on the whole saving for retirement, and particularly if they're in a tax-sheltered vehicle, they don't move them. And what's more, corporate bond funds are really only a part of the puzzle. Um, the, talking about data, the Fed revised its data last year and showed that only 17% of corporate bonds are actually held by mutual funds. It's 15% of the UK. I couldn't get the Eurozone number, uh, unfortunately, because I just don't, it's not available, but it's, it's certainly probably gonna be in the same category. So it's not a big proportion. I think one other interesting development is that now the f uh, more and more investors who are asset allocating and moving money in and out are using ETFs instead of mutual funds. So bizarrely enough, ETFs have made mutual funds less <coughs> volatile rather than more. And that's something we need to think about. That doesn't mean there shouldn't be strict regulatory focus. I think that I've argued in the press and on other panels that there should be stress tests for funds, but at a fund level, not at a company level. And I think the wonderful work that Stephen and his team have done, IOSCO and AIFMD are good standards which we can use. So if bond funds aren't the risk, what should be? I think we as uh, a community should look at where have we got new nodes? Mario mentioned ETFs, Lex obviously mentioned clearing houses. This is not to say there is a problem, but these nodes are probably areas that are ripe for extra work. Second point, um, and as a market practitioner, I think we should have real humility about how much macro prudential tools can find to some risks rather than having really robust structures. Policymakers historically, not obviously the ones on these panel, uh, have not been very good at telling when times are exuberant. <laughs> and at a time when uh, uh, Janet Yellen tells us that the inflation is still a mystery, which is, let's face it, the primary goal of most central banks, I, I certainly have humility, and I'm sure uh, uh, um, others, this panel will have too. So I think when you think about gaps and weaknesses, very quickly, I want to think about European SMEs. Um, as we try to get more companies, or projects or infrastructure projects to come to the market, these are gonna be small, idiosyncratic, non-investment grade or debutants, each and every one of which are a little bit riskier for a retail investor. We've got USITS funds which require daily liquidity. These are the wrong owners of this paper. Insurance companies due to solvency too are dissuaded from owning the securitizations of this paper and we don't have a pan-European private placement market. And so I would just urge this is an area where I think um, the ECB and ESRB did some great work around securitizations a couple of years ago. I think a private placement market for Europe is an area which I see as a, uh, maybe not classically viewed as macroprudential policy, but I actually think could be one which could be championed uh, and thinking through both the prospectus directive, the insurance regulation, the fund structures and so on. It's a holistic problem which falls between gaps um, of well-intentioned policies. Third is cyber risk. Look, on fintech, the topics which I normally get asked are, will the banks be amazon and will non-bank financial skim the cream so what's left to be regulated is more uh, 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 problematic? But I think the much more interesting question is the dependent, growing dependence of banks on large technology companies to run their infrastructure. And that should give us pause for thought about where is the risk in the system. Um, I'm not saying it's easy to then run stress tests of Microsoft and the like but at least we should be, uh, have our eyes open that the train tracks are now being run beyond the banking system. And a particular cyber risk stands out for me as probably the single biggest area of risk. Take, um, I, I won't, don't, I'm not trying to pick on anyone, but just take Equifax last week. 143 million Americans' data was hacked. F about just under half a trillion Europeans' data was hacked. This is not to say it's systemic, but the scale should just underscore for us all quite how big a risk this could be. And I think that's an area, and I, I think Lex, I'm sure, will have some interesting comments on cyber risk and clearing houses. I'm conscious of time, so I'm gonna turn briefly to my last topic, which is Bitcoin. Look, I sit here in the uh, hallowed rooms of the European Central Bank, and I know few issues in central banking provoke more anxiety than losing control of one's currency. And clearly Bitcoin has provided a perfect illustration of this with the Chinese authorities clamping down. The question du jour is whether Bitcoin is a currency, a security, a fraud, or something else? <laughs> well, going back to the Charles, Good, uh, Charles Goodhart taught me well, um, the classic rules of a currency is it's a store of value. Well, it's, it's moved 25% in eight, nine days. It's probably not. not. Is it a useful medium of exchange? Non plus. Um, a, a, a friend who works in a tech company where they accept Bitcoin for coffee uh, found the coffee was disgusting, so he tried to return it, 
the value of Bitcoin had moved so much that they refused to take his coffee back. <laughs> so, you know, it's not a useful medium exchange. Uh, and digital currencies are not as secure as promoted because these exchanges have been hacked in large size. So it's not a currency. Let's just, let's be guessing. It's possibly a security. So poor old Stephen may have another, <laughs> another responsibility on the ones that Mario put on him last week. I don't think that uh, clamping down on initial coin offerings will stop speculators enthusiasts. The simple truth is printing money is a very uh, profitable uh, business and certainly one which has been Im important and that's why throughout history printing currencies has been the domain for kings and queens. But I think that this is an area where macro policy just needs to think through what is the right way to assess what's something which is small but clearly has risks which might infect the banking system through money la anti money ring laundering, know your customers, or potentially through uh, other risks. And I don't think I have in four seconds a policy pronouncement, but it's something that I think is, is, is an area which could, beyond banking, be important. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for all the topics, uh, including the last one, um, which indeed, uh, I am surrounded by two uh, uh, Dutch nationals, so I can say that uh, uh, Bitcoin is a sort of tulip. Uh, it's an, uh, <laughs> it's uh, indeed uh, an instrument of speculation uh, for uh, those that uh, uh, want to bet in something that can go up and down 50 or 40 percent in uh, a few days, uh, but certainly not a currency, and uh, certainly we don't see it as a threat to central banking or monetary policy, uh, so that's uh, for sure. Um, very good, but precisely your last point, uh, appealing to the uh, discussion of the issue of cybersecurity, uh, leads me uh, to now, as we have time, so I thank the uh, panelists for having kept uh, the, the time that they uh, had allotted. Uh, I will start by a short phase of uh, interaction among the members of the panel. So. Uh, uh, Lex, you can start, or Gabriel? Like start? No. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah. Lex. <sighs> Three quick, uh, quick points. Uh, for, first, a response to your challenge on the uh, anti-procyclicality, anti and let me yeah. a bit clarify what, uh, what I have in, uh, have in mind. Uh, I was referring, first of all, to anti-procyclicality policy in CCP. So yeah, 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 that's, that's, uh, that's, my, uh, that's mm -hmm. the first point. Then I think there are very uh, strong arguments for having such, uh, such policies, uh, but there are also strong arguments for having them not as, as discretionary uh, policies. That would lead to, to additional uncertainty that could be uh, counter uh, Predictive, and you have to you have to be aware that that's quite a number of the markets you are talking about are really global uh, global markets uh, by now, and that would that would create a huge coordination effort uh, if you want to intervene in a discretionary uh, discretionary way, and you will never have uh, the data for doing that in the in the right way. You would uh, run the risk of making huge uh, mistakes. You would upset, you would create uncertainty of the governance of the, the CCP. Who is in charge of setting the margins? Is it the CCP or is it uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a corporation of uh, regulators? It's far better to, to uh, go the road and uh, further develop the road that I re uh, refer to do it rules-based uh, and translate your anti-cyclicality uh, requirements, in requirements for the models that you use in setting uh, the margins and, in, and for the procedures that you, uh, that you use. So I think we, we agree on the, the, mm -hmm. the necessity of uh, anti-procyclicality uh, margins, but I do think we disagree on whether that should be done in a discretionary way or more in a rules-based uh, rules based way. Uh, Second remark, and I will uh, only make two, because I'll mm -hmm. also give the others uh, mm -hmm. room. Uh, that's, uh, that's more a concern that I hinted at in my introduction. Uh, and that, that's more the, di the direction that uh, I see macro potential policies uh, moving into. I think the objective uh, is, is far too ambitious for what is, uh, for what is possible. Uh, systemic risk, containing systemic risk, I think, is, a, is simply too pretentious. Uh, 
systemic risk itself as a concept is non-operational. It is not measurable. Uh, it would lead, trying to measure it, uh, leads to huge data uh, requirements. Uh, you will always conclude uh, that th there are data gaps. The previous panel uh, was an example of uh, that. I think I've never uh, so far uh, attended any conference on macroprudential where not one of the conclusions was we need more data mm -hmm. and we need further research. <laughs> and that will, that I, I here make the prediction that in 10 years time, when we sit here, that will still yeah, be the conclusion sure. if we go uh, that road. We will all be very tired of having collected all kinds of information, <laughs> but you have no clue what to do with it. And uh, it doesn't, in the end, the perfect becomes uh, the enemy of the, of the, uh, the route. So the objective, I think a realistic objective, uh, and that is feasible, is creating, as I said earlier, the right conditions for a resilient financial system. And then not only look at the, the in, a, in a narrow base tools that you have as a macro potential supervisor, but, but focus on, the, uh, on what is required from the other policies. For instance, that struck me, uh, Gabriel, in your introduction. I yep. think it, it's, it's very interesting what you're doing, and I think it's useful, but it is it's the insurance sector. Where is the it's sector policy. It's not macro prudential mm. uh, policy in my, uh, in my mind. So look at the other, uh, other policies, and then one uh, perhaps provocative question uh, at, at, at the end. If I look back uh, over the past 40, 50 uh, years or so, and if you roughly want to, to see what, what has happened in terms of potential building up of systemic fragility, systemic uncertainty, uh, what strikes out is the enormous growth of financial markets in the, uh, in the financial system. Just uh, one figure that I know by heart, and it's again, it's for the Netherlands. I'm happy that there's mm -hmm. a lot of focus on our country uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this afternoon. Early 70s, the size of the financial sector in total in the Netherlands was around 150% of GDP. And it exploded to 600% of GDP. My question is, isn't there a responsibility of monetary policy for allowing that, for making that to happen. And it's not one of the elephants in the room, is monetary policy. And if we, we can look at all kinds of details uh, of, 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 of individual sectors and in great, mm. great detail. But if we do not focus on the policy requirements of other policies, yeah. I think we, we, we are missing, what is it, the trees for the woods. Mm. Yeah, well, um, you just <laughs> alluded to two points that are hugely controversial. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> and uh, to uh, spring those at, um, at this time of the uh, panel <laughs> is really a bit unfair. It's really a bit unfair because I could not disagree more with uh, your two <laughs> points. Uh, and <laughs> just that uh, macro proof should be only about resilience and nothing about uh, smoothing the uh, financial cycle because there are no good indicators of systemic risk. I would defy that. Uh, there are uh, many attempts of having indicators. And in particular, there are indeed uh, uh, synthetic indicators, composite indicators, that uh, it, it can be proved and showed uh, by backward uh, testing that are good predictors of prices. Uh, and they are not so complicated to, uh, to gather the information uh, on those indicators. This is not about micro or granular uh, um, information, for instance. Uh, and that uh, leads me to the second point. Uh, when you say that uh, the growth of the financial uh, sector is huge, well, that in itself, uh, history proves it, is a sort of early warning about the uh, crisis to come, uh, but uh, which then leads after the crisis. We have now uh, a segment of literature on, uh, uh, on finance that shows or tends to prove that there is already too much finance, uh, and that's a field of uh, research. 
but I would uh, submit that it's not for interest rates to control that because that has uh, expanded and exploded for uh, all sorts of other reasons which could only be addressed by uh, uh, regulatory uh, measures and not by monetary policy. But I, I, I fear that we have to stop here this huge debate uh, <laughs> and leave it for, for another time. Uh, but fa it fa fa fair enough. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I don't, I don't agree with your uh, Dutch metaphor, which I have heard you uh, uh, use <laughs> once, I think, which is that macro pro is about building the uh, the protection and not to control the ocean, the the the, the tides. Uh, it's about uh, your Dutch. Uh, knowledge of uh, containing the sea and not about smoothing the sea. Uh, well, I, the analogy, <laughs> the metaphor can be uh, interesting, but it's not, in my view, appropriate. <laughs> yeah. I, I restrain myself. Here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Gab Gabriel, please. Thanks. Uh, a couple of points on what was uh, mentioned. Let me start by this one in terms of uh, that you mentioned, Lex, on the that we, 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 we cannot see things in isolation, totally in agreement, you know, and that's precisely, you know, if you look at the, the kind of conceptual framework that we're trying to devise, it's precisely to, to look at that, uh, to, to try to put the insurance uh, in, in the context of the overall financial market and what kind of external, externalities you can see there. I can give you an example, you know, you need to really understand the activities of uh, insurers and the type of asset liability management that they do in order to understand then also the possible externalities. An insurer, for example, holding uh, a lot of derivatives, it's completely different if they are backing, uh, basically edging a certain type of business and a certain type of liabilities, or if it is non-edgeable, if they're not using this for, ed for edging purpose purposes. So I think that it's very much uh, important to understand what are the characteristics of the activity that because this, this at the end of the day brings the risk profile on top of it. And when, when uh, someone was mentioning, of course, all this boom of, um, of investment funds, I think it's, it, it would be really important to look from a macro potential perspective to the investment fund area to understand you know, to what extent a good part of these, of these investment funds are owned by institutional investors, namely, pension funds and insurance companies that have certain types of liabilities backing them. So when you look from a stress perspective, you know, to investment funds, you need to understand what is the, the risk profile of the liabilities that are, you know, backing then these, um, these, uh, these asset exposures. And so it is very important to understand this in a, in a, in not in an isolation perspective because you will have different types of externalities depending on the activities mm. and the risk profiles of, uh, of, of, in this case, of course, uh, uh, the, 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 where the asset exposures are in. And that's why it's very important to have data. And I, I totally agree with you that, you know, if you talk with, uh, with uh, supervisors and, uh, and researchers, the data is never enough. That's, that's, that's obvious. But I think that, uh, let's be also honest, we're coming from a situation where we were basically driving a car, you know, without having sufficient information on, on this. That's clear. Huh? Mm -hmm. So we are now much better. We have, of course, uh, for example, in, in Solvency 2, we have now uh, uh, harmonized uh, information uh, around Europe. We have a centralized database in AOPA that we, we are starting really to use to understand better all these elements of interconnectedness also. We have now a consultation on pension funds together with the ECB uh, that we have worked quite well together also to understand and to get better data from pension funds that are also quite active in the, in the market. So I think we're going in the right direction, definitely. Mm -hmm. Let me just mention another point, uh, uh, which yes, is on the very briefly because I wanted yes, to ask some yes. questions from the audience on the cyber on the mm -hmm. cyber risk. Just uh, that that point, I think it's a very important one, and I, I couldn't agree more that we are not looking at uh, I would say uh, so closely, and uh, we should look at the clouds, the information that is from the all the financial system now resident in clouds, hugely concentrated. If there's a cyber attack, I think we can have really some problems in terms of a systematic event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Uh, do, uh, yes, Stephen, please. Uh, you, uh, yeah, a, a few, um, yeah. a few uh, short uh, comments. I think first on the role of uh, asset management and the, the linkages uh, to, let's say, the insurance sector and pension funds. 
the biggest link is between the mandates. So if you, if you look at the EU asset management sector, about half of it is, is funds. The other half is about mandates uh, that they get. And these mandates are indeed mainly uh, in uh, family offices, um, uh, insurance company, pension funds. Uh, and basically they are managing on behalf of, uh, of the, um, uh, the client their, their balance. So I think there is... Um, uh, that is a very different type of asset, uh, part of yeah. the asset management industry <laughs> than the fund. And, but it's right, and part of the fund industry, the funds themselves end up also on the balance sheets of pension funds and uh, insurance companies. Uh, on the Thanks. issue about time varying or should we hardwire stability into the system, uh, I think it was not only my fellow Dutchman that had a preference for that model, but I understand also you had some uh, preference for them. And it might also be just a reflection of how advanced we are in securities markets. But I indeed, I think considering where we currently are and our thinking, it seems to be it is so difficult to predict where we are in the cycle in financial markets. I would be so I'm, I'm completely into uh, central clearing because it makes the system safer. I can see also going for uh, explicit uh, leverage limits in the, uh, the AFMD sector, but then making also the next step and to say we need to make this time varying, I don't think we have the models, the intelligence, the data to, to do that at this stage in a credible way. Very briefly on ETFs, on ETFs, uh, I know there, this has been raised as a concern. I would like to make uh, a few re uh, short remarks on ETFs. First of all, the benefits of ETF from a consumer protection perspective are, are clearly there. And it's very awkward that in the EU, active managed active funds end up more in the hands of uh, final consumers than in the industry. And so the professional investors, so professional investors more use ETFs than retail consumers. And that questions, is there a problem with mis-selling, et cetera? Secondly, we know at this stage is that active investment still has a very poor record. And that indicates that there is no bubble, or at least not an easily identifiable bubble, in the sense that if you use research uh, and trying to identify over or under valuations, it doesn't result in a lot of success. So I will be very nuanced and careful about saying ETFs is the next big trouble. It is also an area where I can see positives for um, the consumer side of uh, financial markets. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so, Mario, you want to? Yeah, well, so just to be very clear, given that I raised ETF, I didn't mean at all that is the <laughs> next bubble. I just said it is worth looking at that in relationship to what you said, to the dimension of one vis-a-vis -vis the others. So if the dimension of one and the other change is worth looking at that, the benefit for the consumer are obvious. Okay. And, uh, and there's no doubt on that. Maybe one simple point on cyber, where I agree very much with my neighbor here. Um, but I think the cyber risk uh, go all across. It's not only a non-banking issue, of course. They can devastate yeah, uh, a bank much more than a non-banking. Uh, the EC has made uh, the digital single market and the protection of it one of the priorities. So I think that on that we fully agree. I, on the other hand, I slightly disagree with uh, Lex. Uh, on the fact that data gaps is an easy conclusion. I think that uh, the, um, the progress we have made in the last few years in terms not only of collecting data, but also in terms of reducing the cost of collecting data because the proposal on uh, data collection that we give to ESMA, the power that we give to ESMA is exactly for that. It's not to have more data, but to have the same data at a much lower cost. So I think that that deserves attention. Thank you. you you were the, the last, but you still have an opportunity. Uh, so. the, no, the only thing I'd say, uh, so, so the two things I'd say is one on Gabrielle, I mean, I agree we need to understand the type of owners of different paper, uh, but I am struck during the crisis, it was sophisticated investors often who end up being the first to pull the trigger. So actually, I'm not sure necessarily, even though they did have long-term uh, liabilities. And second, I don't think any of us know yet what mark-to-market -market accounting will do to their propensity to sell. And so I just actually have a bit of humility whether uh, institutional investors will actually be so uh, long-termist there. Uh, I also am, uh, think the big exam question, maybe I won't put it quite how Lex did, is, is going from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening is probably the big exam question for our table. And I think it is a, a difficult one to have in five minutes. Yes, of course, but uh, yeah, <laughs> we will see. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it will be, uh, as, as it has been announced in the US, in the US, it will be a very gradual process. <laughs> um, so, um, 
I now uh, stop and open uh, the Q&A 